وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد كتاب الصيام The Book of Fasting from the book الدرر البهية في المسائل الفقهية written by محمد بن علي الشوكاني رحمه الله Fasting is around the corner so we chose to take it from this book, inshallah ta'ala. All of you have the booklet. So inshallah ta'ala, you can write the benefits on the bottom, bi'idhnillah al-kareem. What does fasting mean? Linguistically, and what does it mean technically? As-siyamu lughatan is al-imsak. Fasting linguistically means to withhold. So what does fasting linguistically mean? It's to withhold, al-imsak. وَلِذَلِكَ أَنَّابِغَةُ الذُّبْيَانِ one of the pre-Islamic poets, he said, خَيْلٌ صِيَامٌ وَخَيْلٌ غَيْرُ صَائِمَةٍ تَحْتَ الْعَجَاجِ وَأُخْرَى تَعْلِقُ اللُّجُمَا So here he says, خَيْلٌ صِيَامٌ وَخَيْلٌ غَيْرُ صَائِمَةٍ A horse which is صِيَامٌ صِيَامٌ here means which is withheld with the rope. It's pulling it back. It's withholding it. So linguistically, the Arabs, linguistically, in the language, before Islam, they used to use this word, siyam. And what did they understand it to be? They understood it to mean to withhold. So the horse, when you're riding, what do you do? You hold it backwards. Huh? You pull it backwards. Ah. That's what it means. And if a person chooses not to talk, if a person chooses not to speak, it's also called fasting. And that's why Maryam, she said, إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ so what did she say? I made a covenant with Allah. What? Soman. And what does she mean here? That I'm going to withhold speaking. So she's using, Maryam is using the linguistic meaning, which is, I will withhold from speech. So the word as-sawm means linguistically to withhold. If you withhold from speaking, you are fasting. You are, you are Doing siyam. If you withhold from moving and you stand still, you're also what? Siyam. All of those meanings are in it. But the Quran and the Sunnah, when they took the term, they placed extra meaning on it. And the meanings that they added to it is that you are not withholding from speech and you are not withholding from movement. Rather, what you're withholding from is three things. So fasting, we withhold from how many things? Three things. The first one is, we withhold from uh, eating. And the second thing that we withhold from is drinking. And the third thing that we withhold from is intimacy. So you're now withholding from those three things. Eating, drinking, and sexual intercourse. Everything else that breaks your fast, that will nullify your fast, Goes back to one of those, goes back to one of those three. It's either something that's got to do with food, and the scholars, they give it the ruling of food. Like for example, if they put into your mouth, uh, doctors, if they put into your mouth a tube or something, and etc. Then it takes the ruling of what? Food. If injection is put into you and that gives you nourishment, it's food. Or drinking, or sexual into. Sexual intercourse. And we'll speak about that in more details. Those three you withhold. Is it just mere withholding? No. You're withholding from it. Ta'abudan lillahi. Worshipping Allah based on that. So you have an intention to get closer to Allah by doing this. It's not like at night time you say, you know, tonight I'm not going to eat no food. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to have intimacy with my wife. No. It means that you are doing this to get closer to who? Allah. And the third point is that... It occurs between من طلوع الفجر الصادق إلى غروب الشمس. It starts at a particular time, which is when the sun sunsets, 
So only sunrises and sunset. Within that period of time, the person is what? Fasting. And then three things I mentioned that the definition of fasting holds. What is it? That's number one. You withhold from three things. Eating, Eating drinking, and intimacy. Sexual intercourse. That's one. Two is what? You're doing it to get, you're doing it to get closer to who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three, what did we say? You do it from sunrise to what? To sunset. That's the three meanings that it holds. Now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go into the book. Naam. Fadl. The Book of Fasting. Fasting Ramadan becomes obligatory once its presence is seen by a trustworthy Muslim individual. Otherwise, Shaban must be completed. The Sheikh now mentions that fasting is obligatory. So, point number one is Yajibu Siyamu Ramadan. Let's stand over that point. Fasting is what? Obligatory. So when the Sheikh says that it's obligatory, he has to bring it from the Quran and the Sunnah and the consents. Those are the three evidences that we take. The Quran is an evidence for us. The Sunnah and what the Prophet said and done is an evidence for us. And the consents is also a what? It's an evidence for us. Those three, ref- those three can make things obligatory. Shawkani, the author of this book, he can't make things obligatory. And no one else can make things obligatory. The Quran Allah says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 183. In this ayah Allah says that all oh, those of you who believe, we have made obligatory on you fasting as we made obligatory fasting on those who came before you so you can attain piety from your fasting. So the ayah, what does it say? Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu kutiba. Kutiba, what does it mean? Ay furida alaykum. It was made obligatory Onto you. Also, Allah said in another ayah, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ Anyone who sees the month of Ramadan come in, Allah says, فَلْيَصُمْ Fast. And when Allah commands something, what does it show, brothers? Obligation. If Allah commands something, what does it show? Obligation that we have to do it. And also the hadith of the Prophet, which is the second evidence, بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامُ عَلَى خَمْسٍ Islam is built upon what? Five pillars. And from the five pillars that is built upon it, one of it is what? Wasom wasiyam Ramadan. The fasting of the month of Ramadan. The consent that fasting is obligatory is transmitted by two scholars, inshallah ta'ala, that I will bring. The first one of them is Ibn Qudama rahimahullah. He, he transmitted a consensus in this issue. He said, وَأَجْمَعَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ The Muslims are unanimously in agreement عَلَىٰ وُجُوبِ الصِّيَامِ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ That the fasting of Ramadan is obligatory. Al-Imam al-Nawawiy also transmitted a consensus. What did he say? إِنَّ صَوْمَ رَمَضَانِ The fasting of Ramadan is رُكْنٌ وَفَرْضٌ بِالْإِجْمَعَ It's a pillar and it's obligatory by what? By consensus. It's obligatory. So we have the Quran and the Sunnah making it and the consensus showing us that it's obligatory to fast in the month of Ramadan. The author then mentioned another mas'ala which is when does it become obligatory? Okay, or when can we say Ramadan came in? Brothers, pay attention, focus inshallah ta'ala. When can we say Ramadan entered? Ramadan enters, two things can make Ramadan come in or that we can say Ramadan has entered. The first one of them is لِرُؤْيَةِ هِلَالِهِ مِنْ عَدْلٍ A trustworthy person, a person who is reliable, has informed us that Ramadan has come in. Okay, a trustworthy individual says, I have cited the crescent and I have seen it. So we Muslims have now, we have to fast. Okay, we all have to what? We all have to fast. The scholars, they differed upon is it enough for one person to see it who's reliable, trustworthy? <coughs> According to the statement of the author, he's of the opinion that one individual who's trustworthy is enough to tell us that Ramadan has entered. And he's using, and he's relying on the hadith, he's relying on the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He sighted the moon and he saw the moon, and when he saw the moon, Oh, he, he cited the, uh, he saw the crescent. And so what did he do? He went to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and he informed him of it. And he said to the prophet, 
إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ I saw the crescent. فَصَامَ The Prophet fasted. وَأَمَرَ النَّاسَ بِصِيَامِ And the Prophet commanded the people to all fast. And Abdullah ibn Umar was is only one person, right? So the author says, Rahimahullah, this is what it is. That one person is enough to do it. And this view, of course, that one person is enough is the view held by Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Rahimahullah. And it is, Fi ahadi qawlay al Imam Shafi'i. It's one of the views held by who? Al Imam Shafi'i. And Al Imam al he says, Wa huwa al asahu fil mas'ala. And this is the strongest opinion. He says that. Lakin they differ on, sorry, the, uh, as for the Ramadan coming in, brothers, one person is enough. And that is the strongest opinion. Lakin the leaving of Ramadan, one person is not enough. When Ramadan is leaving, and Sha'ban is coming in, no, we want two people. The reason why we say two people is needed for other than Ramadan is because the asal of the witnesses is how many? Two. Al asl fi shahadati al ithnain. The asal of a witness is two people in our religion. Shah, sah. Allah always commands us to bring two witnesses for every matter that we want to. So any testimony, any witnesses, two people is the asal. Like in the entering of Ramadan, there is a evidence that removes it from that asal, which is the hadith of Ibn Umar. As for the leaving of Sha'ban, there is no evidence that removed it from the two people. Am I making sense, brothers? Meaning we leave it at its original... Uh, Evidences, which is that it's two witnesses that's needed for everything. Even in Ramadan coming in. Yes, even in Ramadan coming in. But we found the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, who he himself saw the crescent, and he cited it, and the Prophet took his witness. So we now take it. Okay, brothers. As for Sha'ban leaving, we don't have an evidence like that. So we leave it at the original, which is that two people are needed. Not to mention there's also a ragba, a desire for a person to say Ramadan has gone. Even if he's adil, Shahwa can enter his heart to want the Ramadan to finish for what? For him to leave it. Are we all together, brothers? Naam. The second thing that Ramadan is established on is Ikmalu Iddat Shaban. And this happens when we cannot see the crescent anymore. For in Wumma Alaikum, the Prophet said, if the moon is not clear and it can't be seen, then what happens is the second thing that we use is we let the month of Shaban be 30. Are we all together, brothers? 13 nights, it completes, and then we say the next day is Ramadan. So Ramadan comes in with two things. What is the first one? On the 29th night, a person says, I sighted the moon. Okay, because the month in the Islamic calendar, it can be 29 or it can be 30. So on the 29th night, if a reliable, trustworthy person comes and says, I saw the moon, we fast the next day. If the moon is not seen because of something that's, that is a cloud on it, it's blurry, it cannot be seen, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to us in the hadith, Sumu li ru'yati, fast by seeing it. Wa aftiru li ru'yati, and break the fasting based on seeing it. Then the Prophet said, فَإِنْ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَكْمِلُ عِدَّةَ الشَّعْبَانِ ثَلَاثِينَ And if you can't see it because it becomes blurry, then finish the month of Sha'ban 30. So this is what the author, rahimahullah, had told us. Is, that, is it clear for everybody that point? No. What is the fast 30 days unless the presence of Shawal is seen before Ramadan is completed? If the inhabitants of a certain area, i.e. a country, a city, a town or a village, etc. see the crescent of Ramadan, then fast the month, other areas must also do the same. Now the author, rahimahullah, he goes into a mas'ala which is um, if a إِذَا رَأَوْهُ أَهْلُ بَلَدٍ a country cites the crescent, okay, which hasn't become clear for another people. They have not seen it. It's only been seen in one side of the world. What should they do in this particular situation? Meaning seen somewhere. The scholars, they differed upon this issue of the sighting of the moon. Should we just take one country says that they saw it and we should all follow it? Or should we what? Each country should look at their own their own land and say, since our salawat is all separate, we pray dhuhr at a time when they don't pray dhuhr. So the Ramadan is what? It's also something that we shouldn't have to wait or shouldn't have to take from another, another country. Ala kulli hal, that which seems to be apparent and strong, inshallah ta'ala, is that when it's sighted somewhere, the rest of the Muslim world should follow it. Based on the statement of the Prophet, which is, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi. The Prophet said, 
fast based on seeing it and break Ramadan and finish the month of Ramadan based on the sighting. And the sighting has already happened. It's been seen by somebody. It's been seen by a country. So we should all follow that country and based our fasting on it. As for the hadith of Quraib in the Muslim, the hadith of Quraib in Sahih Muslim, and Imam Shawkani responds to that, that that's not an evidence for those who say, you don't have to take the other country. And the Muslims should try to unite in this particular issue. Naam. The one who fasts must determine his intention prior to Fajr. Now the author, Rahimahullah, he goes into an issue which is the intention of fasting in Ramadan. Now, before the fasting day starts, does the person have to have an intention? Or is it enough for the person to have an intention once in the whole month? Is it enough? The scholars, they differed. They differed on this particular issue. Is it enough to say that Ramadan is starting tomorrow? I have the intention to fast every single day and I'm going to fast. Okay? And that's it. That's enough. Or is it a condition that every single day you have to make an intention before Fajr? Huh? This mas'ala goes back to this mas'ala goes back to and it's the asal of the mas'ala is is Ramadan one thing that's together or is each day an independent day from the rest? Are we together brothers? It goes back to this the khilaf is this issue. Is Ramadan all one? That one intention is enough for it. Or is each day an independent day and separate? That which seems apparent is that the month is all one. And the Prophet ﷺ says in the Quran, said, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ الشَّهْرَ The month. So Allah saw it as to be one thing. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the person comes with one intention, inshallah ta'ala, it should be not a problem. بشرط, with a condition. That you do, do. That you do not break your fasting. So if you miss one day and it breaks, then that means when you come back after your illness or whatever reason that or you were a traveler, then you need to start coming with an intention because your intention got broken. Crystal clear, brothers? But from the first day of Ramadan until the 30th day, if you've been fasting and you've not missed one day and your intention has been consistent, then one intention, inshallah ta'ala, should not be a problem. Okay? That's if you take the authenticity of the hadith of Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha, where the Prophet said, Anyone who doesn't have uh, anyone who doesn't have an intention before Fajr, then there's no fasting for that person. There was a time we saw this hadith to be authentic. The hadith is Sahih Mawqufan ala Hafsa. The hadith is authentic to Hafsa. But it's not authentically transmitted to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not authentic to, uh, to who? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the view of Imam Ahmad and Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. That the hadith is mawquf. It stopped at Hafsa. Naam. Chapter 1. Fasting nullifiers. Now the author rahimahullah is going to go into the, um, the things that, the mubtilat al The things that break your fasting. And we already touched on that already, the things that are going to nullify your fasting. Now, The following nullify fasting. Number one, eating. Number two, drinking. Number three, sexual intercourse. Number four, de- deliberately vomiting. So the author, rahimahullah, mentioned how many things that are going to break your fast. He mentioned four things. Let's stand over each one. The first thing that the sheikh mentioned that breaks your fast is eating. Okay? And drinking. We'll take those two together, okay? The evidence for that is وَكُلُوا وَشَرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَطُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ الصِّيَامَ إِلَى الْلَيْلِ So the ayah says وَكُلُوا وَشَرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَطِ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Allah says eat subhanahu wa ta'ala and drink حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ Until it becomes clear to you الفجر الصادق The sun when the sun rises until the sunset you can, before that, you're allowed to eat. Once it, the sun rises, khalas, Fajr has come in, you're not allowed to have it anymore. So we're prohibited here from drinking and eating based on the ayah. The ayah says, eat all night if you want. But when Fajr comes in until sunset, Maghrib, you're not allowed to what? 
You're not allowed to eat. This is in the ayah. And also the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, Yatruku, the person leaves off ta'amuhu wa sharabuhu wa shahwatuhu min ajli. The person leaves off their food. The person leaves off their eating and their desires for whose sake? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the author rahimahullah's evidence that you can't eat and drink is this. The sexual intercourse is in the hadith that I mentioned. The person leaves off their desires, the Prophet said. That Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala hadith al-Qudsi, يَتْرُكُ طَعَامُهُ وَشَرَابُهُ وَشَهْوَتُهُ His desires. And then the shahwa, as Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah mentions, is not general. It's only intimacy, faqat. Because if you say desires in general, then that means sleeping is a desire. And sleeping doesn't break your fast. Okay, brothers? It doesn't. So what it means here is shahwatuhu, don't translate it in English and say desires. And many translate it as desire. Say sexual intercourse, specifically. Because the person who's reading is going to see that desire is anything that breaks. If a person is joking with his friends and he's enjoying his, 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 his time, or she's enjoying her time, that doesn't mean it breaks their fast. So those are the three that the ayah or the hadith mentions. Like in pay attention. All of this the author mentions at the ending of it. He says deliberately. If the person eats deliberately, if the person what? Drinks deliberately, or if the, if the person has sexual intercourse deliberately. The food and the drink, we have evidence for it. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Man nasiya, anyone who forgets, wa huwa sa'imun, he, was far, he forgot that he was fasting. Fa'akala aw shariba, he drinks and he eats. Falyutimma sawmahu, complete your fasting. Fa'in fallahu at'amahu wa saqah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to feed you. If you eat and you drink, then carry on your fasting, inshaAllah ta'ala. Don't worry, Allah has chosen to feed you. And Allah has chosen to provide you with water. If a person sees you like in eating and drinking, they should stop you. Based on the hadith of Sa'id al-Khudri fi sahihayn Man ra'a minkum munkaran, liwayiruhu bi yadi, fa illam yastati' fa bi lisani, fa illam yastati' fa bi qalbi, wa dhalika ad'afu al-iman. If you see a person drinking, this is munkar. In Ramadan, no one should drink. And no one should eat. So you should tell the person, to stop. You shouldn't say Allah is providing for them. I shouldn't interfere. No, you should stop the person and say what you're drinking. It's the month of Ramadan. Lakin, pay attention. Sexual intercourse, does it say, take the same ruling? And is it the same? The scholars, they differ on this issue. And we'll come to that in more details, inshallah ta'ala. If the person deliberately eats and the person deliberately drinks, do they have to bring back that fasting? They deliberately ate and they de deliberately drank in the month of Ramadan. Do they have to bring it back? Is there qada on them? And sexual intercourse, the person deliberately had it. Sexual intercourse, the person has to come with a kafara. There's an expiation for that one. But is there qada? Do you have to bring it back? Eating and drinking doesn't have kafara. Like in sexual intercourse, what does it have? It has a kafara. That you have to come with. And the kafara is the kafara to dihar. Which is, You free a slave. You haven't got it. You have to fast. How many months? Oh, you feed what? 64 you feed. That's if the person has sexual intercourse deliberately. Like in drinking and eating, like even the shokani says that there has to be Pay attention, brothers. The question here is, if the person deliberately drinks, they deliberately eat, and they deliberately have sexual intercourse, do they have to bring it back? This mas'ala goes back to, brothers, this khilaf of the scholars goes back to, to bring back something after you deliberately missed it. Does it require a new command or is the previous obligation still there? Am I making sense? Am I making sense? We were commanded to fast in the month of what Allah said, Ya Yaladin Amanu Kutiba alaikum siyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min kablikum la alakum tatakun. You were commanded to fast in Ramadan. This person deliberately missed in Ramadan. Is that command, Ya Yaladina Amanu Kutiba alaikum siyamu? Does it still stand for that as an evidence for outside Ramadan? Can we use that evidence for outside, outside Ramadan? Or do we need a new evidence to say that the person has to bring back the fasting? 
Does that make sense? Example, another example is a person deliberately misses the Salat of Dhuhr. They see the time of Dhuhr come in and they deliberately miss it. And what happens? Dhuhr goes. And then Isha time comes and they say, no, you know what, I'm going to now pray all of the Salahs that I missed. Are they allowed to bring it back? Wa'aqimu salah established a prayer. Is that the evidence that they use or do they, new, do they need a new evidence to pray outside its time? The qawl al is that if you miss a salah deliberately, you're not allowed to bring it back. You need a new evidence for that. Because the salah had a time. Inna salat kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta. Same is with Ramadan. If a person deliberately drinks and deliberately eats and they deliberately have sexual intercourse, this fasting was restricted to this time. So you are not going to bring it back after outside Ramadan. What you have to come with what? What you have to come with is a tawbah and istighfar. And this is the view held by Imam Shafi'i wal Awza'i, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abu Huraira, and Ahad al Riwayatain, and Ahmad al Rahimahullah. It's the strongest opinion. As for sexual intercourse, I mentioned the hadith of the Prophet where he says, Yatruku ta'amu wa sharabu wa shahwatuhu min ajli. The hadith al Qudsi. And also the statement of Allah, Uhilla lakum layla tasiyam al rafathu ila nisaikum. The word rafath here means what? Al jima'ah. That you are allowed to have sexual intercourse with your wife at night time in the month of Ramadan, but you are not allowed to have it outside that time. <coughs> Naam. al rasal fasting, i.e. to fast more than one day continuously is forbidden. There's a mess at one I missed, sorry. I mentioned eating, drinking and sexual intercourse and I missed the fourth one which was what? Vomiting. The author, rahimahullah, he says, وَالْقَيُّ amdan." Uh, if the person vomits, what? Huh? Deliberately. al amdan means to deliberately vomit. If the person, it comes out and it over, overpowers the individual, it comes out without their intention, then we have a hadith for that where the Prophet said, مَنْ ذَرَأَهُ الْقَيُّ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ قَضَى As for what about if the person brings it out? وَمَنِ اسْتَسْقَى عَمْدًا فَلْيَقْضِي The Prophet said, if the person deliberately what? Vomits himself, brings it out, then he should he should um, bring back that fasting. The Prophet Sallallahu said that. فَلْيَقْضِي He should do qada. This hadith, the scholars, they differed regarding its authenticity. Whether it's authentic. And whether it's what? If it's sahih, there's a khilaf. Even though there might be khilaf or not, the asal is that, that it's implemented asal. Because there's ijma. The hadith sahih is weak. Like there's a consent in the issue. That is transmitted by Al Imam Ibn al Mundir and Al Imam al Khattabi. Both of them transmitted a consent where that if the person vomit overcomes him and they vomit in Ramadan, that they can carry on their fasting, there's nothing upon them. And that if the person deliberately makes himself vomit, that he has to bring that fasting back, it's a consent. So there's no authentic hadith, there's only what? There's only consent. Naam. Al-Wisal fasting, i.e. to fast more than one day continuously is forbidden. Now the author, he goes into something that is known as Al-Wisal. Wisal means that the person fasts two days or more without eating or drinking. This is haram. It is what? It is haram for a person to do what? Al-Wisal. And the evidence for that is the hadith of Abu Huraira ibn Umar Aisha fi sahihain Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he prohibited the companions from doing wisal, which is to fast continuously without breaking the fast. They're not going to eat anything, no iftar, no suhoor, nothing. The fast is just going to go on days after days after days. It's just going to carry on. So the Sahabas, they saw the Prophet do that. They saw him do it. And so they copied him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when the Prophet prohibited them from it, they said to him, فَإِنَّكَ تُوَاصِلُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ You're doing it. And then the Prophet said to him, مثلي, which of from amongst you is like me? Ah. I, Nabi Allah Muhammad, get fed by who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives me and I drink and I eat, but you guys won't be able to comprehend that, he said. Ah. Meaning he gets the ability, the strength of a person who's eaten and drunk, he gets the ability and the strength like that. But the Sahabas didn't want him to stop. So they were following him and they were doing it like him. And so the Prophet Allah, when they, he saw that they were not listening and that they wanted to do and they were copying him, he fast for days and he never stopped. And they were fasting with him. Some of them were becoming weak and he was saying, he was looking at them and they were carrying on and they got saved. They got saved by their month of month finishing. 
And the Prophet said, if only the month didn't finish. Uh, if, the only, if the month did not finish, وصالن, I would have carried a carrying on. المتعمقون, Those who have been extreme, who have been tough on themselves, would have realized they cannot endure it. They don't have the ability and the strength for it. So wisal is not permissible. Like Abdullah ibn Zubair, it was said that he fasted for how many days? 15 days consecutively. He never ate nothing. He never drank nothing. 15 days, he fasted continuously. Abdullah ibn Zubair. And then this is khususiyah. It's specific to who? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's not permissible for anybody uh, to do it. Lakin, you're allowed to do wisal until suhoor. Meaning you can miss iftar if you want. There's evidence for that. What you can do is, when the iftar time comes, you don't eat have iftar. You just go to them, you do your thing. And when the suhoor comes, you eat your suhoor. Before, before fajr. And the evidence for that is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said, لا تواصلوا. Don't do wisal. Don't do continuous fasting. And then he said, فَأَيُّكُمْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُوَاصِلُ Whoever from amongst you wants to do a continuous fasting, فَلْيُوَاصِلْ حَتَّى السُّحُورِ Then he should do it until suhoor. Until sahar. Naam. One who deliberately nullifies his fasting must expiate. So if a person deliberately breaks his fasting, he should what? This statement of Imam al-Shawkani, fihi nadar. Because expiation is specific to intimacy only. And it's not for... He, he made it general, right? He's made it general. Anyone who breaks their fasting deliberately. No, it's specific to the one who is... Who had sexual... The one who had sexual intercourse. Based on the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, a man who had intimacy with his wife in the month of Ramadan, and he came to the Prophet and he told the Prophet ﷺ what he did. And then the Prophet said to him, هَلْ تَجِدُ مَا تُعْتِقُ رَقَبَةً Can you, Do you have a slave to free? قَالَ لَهِ He said, I don't have it, Ya Rasulullah. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, can you fast two consecutive months, not break in one day? قَالَ لَهِ He said, I don't have the ability to do that. Then the Prophet said, have you got the ability to feed 60? قَالَ لَا He said, I don't. And then it was brought to him بِعَرَقٍ مِّن تَمْرٍ a, a portion of dates were brought to the man, the Prophet ﷺ, and they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, give it to him and tell him to give it out. Then the Prophet ﷺ gave it to him and he said, تَصَدَّقْ بِهَذَا Give this out. Then the man looked at the Prophet ﷺ and he said, who's more poor than me? Is there anyone in Medina who's more in need of this than I myself? I need this. And the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at him and he laughed. فَضَحِكَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى بَدَتْ نَوَاجِدُهُ the Prophet laughed so much until his molar teeth could be seen. And then the Prophet said to him, Idhab fa'at'imu ahlak. He then take it home and give it to your family. Uh, I need it more, he said. The hadith is in Sahihain, hadith Abi Huraira and hadith Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. He then the issue of kafara is it's, it's specific to who? It's specific to who? It's specific to the person who deliberately has intimacy with his, with his wife. The person who has Intimacy with his wife. The intimacy, the scholars, they said, is two things. Okay? It's sexual intercourse, even if the person doesn't, uh, if nothing comes out, it doesn't matter. If the two private parts come into contact, then this person's uh, fasting is what? Or, if the man, or the, in the woman, or anyone, does things that make them uh, to come, uh, come out, then this person is what? Then this person is, his fasting is also facet. His fasting is what? It's corrupt. Naam. It is preferred to hasten the futur, breakfast, and delay the suhoor, late dinner. The evidence for this is the hadith of Sahar ibn Sa'ad ibn Sa'idi, that it's good to hasten your iftar, based on the Prophet's hadith uh, statement, where he says, لا يزال الناس بخير, that the people are in good, as long as they what? معجل الفطرة, as long as they hasten the what? The iftar. These the people are upon. Good. This is hadith is in Sahihain. Um, it's in Sahihain. Min hadith is Sahih ibn Sa'ad ibn Sa'idi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. So this is the khair that the people will have when they hasten the iftar. Okay. Some people say to Akhi, I'm, I'm, let me take my time. La. The khair is in hastening it. The minute you hear the adhan, put it in your mouth straight away. That's what the khair is in. As for the delaying of the suhoor until it's closest to the time of fajr, then the evidence for this is. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. 
she was told about two companions. A person came to Aisha and they told her, min ashabi Rasulillah, two men from the companions of the Prophet. Ahaduhuma yu'ajjilu al-iftara wa yu'ajjilu salah uh, One person, he what? He hastens the iftar and he hastens the prayer. And another one, he delays the iftar and he delays the prayer. Both of them. And Aisha then said, Ayyuhum, they asked her which of those two are the best. And then Aisha said, which of those two hastens the iftar and hastens the prayer? And they told her that this is Abdullah ibn Umar. And then she said, Abdullah ibn Umar is in line with what the Prophet used to do. So, naam. Section, rules of making up missed fasts. One who breaks his fast due to a legitimate reason must make it up. Now the author, rahimahullah, he goes into the author, rahimahullah, he goes into the uh, bringing back missed fasts. Is that what you read? Yeah. What did you read? Uh, ah, the person who missed their fast. And the second thing that the author is going to speak about is also what? He's going to speak about the rukhsa, the ease that the sharia has given to an individual. If a person, he breaks their fa they break their fast because of a shari reason. So they didn't deliberately miss the fasting. No, no, they've got an excuse. The sharia gave them an excuse. Like, for example, they're sick or they are a traveler. This person, what do they have to do? They have to bring it back. That's if the Sharia gave you an excuse. Allah says in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ And other, other days you're going to have to bring it back. This is talking about what brothers like and sisters? This is talking about a person who missed fasting based on what? لِعُذْرٍ شَرْعِيٍ uh, The Sharia gave you excuse for this. Not because you deliberately missed it. No, that's another, that we already spoke about. If you deliberately missed it, you don't bring it back. You ask Allah for forgiveness and you repent. Nah. So that's the evidence that the author rahimahullah, is relying on. Nah. Breaking the fast for the one on a journey or the like of him is permitted. For one who fears weakness or harm in battle, for them breaking the fasting becomes a must. Good. The author rahimahullah, he now speaks about the one who is a traveler or Anything other than that he mentions. He says, The person is a traveler. What is the person? The person is a traveler. They're traveling. Okay? The Sharia has given you a rukhsa. If you want, you can fast. And if you want, you can leave it. We'll speak about which one is best. We'll come to that, inshallah ta'ala. But you have the choice. This is called in the Sharia, what is it called? Rukhsa. Rukhsa means you have the choice. It's up to you. Ruqsa means بين الفعل والترك Doing it or leaving it, you have the choice. It's your choice. Do as you wish. The Sheikh then says وَنَحْوِهِ And like that. What does he mean like that? The murdi' the woman who is breastfeeding. And the hubla, the woman who is pregnant. And like that he mentions, sah? Anyone? Anything? And anything like that is a woman who is breastfeeding and a woman who is what? Are we all together? And a woman who is pregnant. The woman who's breastfeeding and the woman that's pregnant, if she breaks her fasting due to her child, and if she breaks her fast due to her own health, it's two different rulings. <coughs> Pay attention to this. If she breaks it because of herself and fear for her own health, and she's worried for her own body and her mind and her energy, then this is like she's a sick person. She takes the ruling of a sick person. She has to bring it back what? She has to bring it back another time. But if she breaks it because of what? She breaks it because of the child and she's doing it for the child, then she doesn't have to do qada. Scholars, they say she has to do a what? Huh? They, she has to feed. She has to feed on those days. And also the qada is needed from her as well. The qada is needed and she also has to do what? 
She has to bring and feed. Now, the author now mentions the traveler. Which one is best for the traveler? The traveler, what is best for him is that which does not weaken him. Okay? The afdaliyah differs from one person to another. If the person becomes weak and is unable, and he becomes physically tired, that he can't even do any actions of righteous deeds. He can't even read Quran, he can't help his family, he can't do anything, he's weak, he's lying down, then he should break his fast. And he's sick. He should break his fast, that's best for him. Naam. As for one who dies before completing fasting, his guardian must take over the fasting. The uh, author now speaks about anyone who dies, alayhi sawman, there is fasting upon him or her, which they have to pay back. Then the guardian, the people who are in charge of your affairs, they have to fast on your behalf. And the evidence that they're using for this is the hadith in Sahihain, that the Prophet said, Man mata wa alayhi siyam, anyone who dies and there's fasting on him, anhu waliyuhu, those your guardians will fast on your behalf. The scholars, they differed. Is this every fasting that is obligatory? Or is it restricted to Sawmun Nadar? Because it came down on the story of Nadar. Okay? Which one is it restricted to? Because remember, Nadar is an obligatory fasting, but it's the fasting that you made obligatory on yourself. It's not what Allah made obligatory on you. The strongest opinion is that, which I, inshallah ta'ala, am inclined to, is that it's restricted to only fasting of Nadar. Okay, because even that though it says man mata wa alayhi siyamun, and this is a nakira, this is a nakira to fi siyak al sharti, and it does show generalization. So it should be every fasting, like in as siyak min al muqayyidat. The context does restrict it, and that the person was speak, the Prophet was speaking to a person whose fasting was fasting nether, that he said that the guardians have to fast on your behalf. So it's not for every single fasting. The only fasting that the guardians have to fast on your behalf is restricted to the fasting of a nether. Meaning is when you make a promise with Allah and you say, oh Allah, I'll do this if you do this for me or whatever. This type of fasting, your family have to fast on your behalf. Or your guardians have to fast on your behalf. Now, Both the unable and the old who can neither perform nor make up for fasting are to expiate by feeding a needy for each day. Naam, so if the person is old and the person is very senile, very old, can't fast, he cannot fast now, nor can he even bring it back. Okay, brothers? He can't fast now, nor can he ever bring it back. He's too old, and he's too tired. He's too weak to do it. Then the evidence is that that, that person, they what? They just have to feed, and they never have to bring it back. Based on the ayah, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَ وَفِدْيَةٌ بَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ Those who haven't got the ability. And the same ruling is for the person who has a what? A chronic illness. A person who has a permanent illness. لَا يُرْجَى بَرْءُ I'm a بُرْءُ Where there's no hope that this person will ever be cured from this illness. Doctors have said, you see, this is, this is a serious illness. You're not going to get up from this. So this person, they fast. They are not able to do it. They're not able to fast now. And they're not able to bring it back. So what we'll say to them is, every day you feed a miskeen. Each day that you feed what? Feed ya to ta'am miskeen. Now. As for the one who is fasting voluntarily, he is the master of himself. There is neither making up nor expiation. This is another mas'ala, which is what about if the fasting is a what? If the fasting is... Um, if the fasting is a voluntary fasting. Read that again one more time. As for one who is fasting voluntarily, he is the master of himself. There is neither making up nor expiation. Now, so the author now goes into the voluntary fasting. A person fasting Mondays and Thursdays, when it reaches Duhur, he feels like, you know, I'm going to break my fast. Does he have to bring back that fasting? Yeah? No, he doesn't have to bring that fasting back. Because the fasting in its asal was what? The asal it was what? The asal is that it was voluntary. So, وَالصَّائِمُ الْمُتَطَوِّعُ أَمْ أَمِيرُ نَفْسِهِ You're the one who governs yourself. If you want, you can carry the fasting. If you want, you can. لكن If you're fasting to bring back Ramadan, 
outside Ramadan and you started the day, okay? You're not allowed to break it. You have no choice. It's like Ramadan for you right now. Have to finish off the day. You can't say, Lord, time, I'm going to bring it back. Have to finish it. And you're not allowed to break it now. Chapter 2. Voluntary fasting. It is recommended to fast six days from Shawwal, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. It is recommended also to fast the month of Muharram, Sha'ban, Mondays and Thursdays, the bright days, i.e. 13th, 14th and 15th of each lunar month. The author now goes into the chapter of At-Tatawwur, the voluntary fastings. We've already taken the wajibat now. We're going to voluntary fasting. The author, rahimahullah, mentions times when fasting is, is voluntary. For example, is Siyamu Sittatim Shawwal, fasting six days of Shawwal. This is based on the hadith of Sahih Muslim and other than it, min hadith Abi Ayyub al Ansari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Prophet says, Man sama Ramadan, anyone who fasts a month of Ramadan, thumma atba'ahu sitta min Shawwal, and then follows it up with six days of Shawwal. Then this is the fasting of a what? It's the fasting of a the whole year. How does that become the fasting of a whole year? Because 30 days multiplied by 10, that becomes 10 months. And then the six days multiply that by 10, it becomes two months. So yeah, how many how many months you got? The 12 months in the year. So anyone who fasts the 30 days of Ramadan and then adds the six days of Shawwal to it, it's like they fasted the whole year. Like in the scholars, they took from this hadith that you have to fast. Some of them, they said that you have to fast what? Because the hadith, what does it say? Man sama Ramadan. Anyone who fasts Ramadan. Thumma and after that, he follows the six days. And in the six days, when, when, when does it, when, where does it come in? After Ramadan. After you fast the Ramadan. And then some scholars, they said that you are not allowed to fast the six days if you haven't fasted. You haven't fasted Ramadan. Some scholars, they said that. And this Ms'ala, we've, in details, we spoke about it, that you're allowed to fast it. Like in the person, shouldn't make it something eh, that they do all the time. Don't make it a norms. Whether you don't, you miss days of Ramadan or days of Ramadan is on you and you haven't fasted uh, it and you go for the six days of Shawwal. Try to fast those days. Especially, especially if the days that you missed, for example, if somebody missed 26 days, مثلا, of Ramadan. Can they ever fast Shawwal? If we say they have to be Ramadan. They can't. So that person definitely will say, okay, fast the Shawwal because the Shawwal is what? It's restricted. It's a period of time. Ramadan is Mwasa. You've got till the next next months to come. Are we together? Like, and if you have less Ramadan, you've got four days of Ramadan and then you've got the remaining month of Shawwal, then finish off the four days of Ramadan and then fast Shawwal. No. The second um, fasting that's voluntary that the author mentioned is وَتِسْعِدِ الْحِجَّةِ ah. the, na- first, the nine, first nine days of Dhul-Hijjah, fasting it, is a voluntary fasting that the Prophet ﷺ would never leave, he would fast it. And the hadith that mentioned fasting those days, there's no evidence for it. Actually, no evidence for it. Ah, there's no, there's no evidence for it. The only evidence that we have is what we have that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, "Ma min ayyam al amal salih fihi na habu ila Allah min hadi ayyam." That righteous deeds are most beloved to Allah those days. So fasting is from the righteous deeds. Naam. Also, fasting in Muharram, when the Prophet ﷺ was asked which month is the best in fasting after Ramadan. The hadith Sahih Muslim in Hadith Abi Huraira. What is the best month to fast after Ramadan? The Prophet was asked, what did he say? He said, Muharram. When the Prophet of Allah was asked, Ayyu siyami afdalu ba'da shahri Ramadan? What's the best fasting after Ramadan? What did he say? The Prophet said, Muharram. Also, the author mentions Sha'ban. Fasting in what? In the month of Sha'ban. Aisha said, 
Ma ra'aytu Rasulullah, I never saw the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha is saying this. I never saw the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fast a whole month, all of it, except Ramadan. Wa ma ra'aytu, and I also never saw, fi shahrin, a month which he fasted the most after Ramadan, then Sha'ban. Meaning it was like he used to fast nearly just about every day of it. He would fast the majority of uh, Sha'ban, which is the month that we're, we're in right now. Also, the Sunnah is to fast every Mondays and Thursdays, based on the, based on the Hadith Sunnah Abi Dawood and Tirmidhi. And also to fast the what? Ayyamul Bil, the white days, based on the Hadith of Abi Qatada, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, which is in Sahih Muslim, that the person fast those. Those three days, those three days of Ayyamul Biyad. Naam. The best of voluntary fasting is to fast every other day. So fasting one day and missing one day. Like the fasting of who? The fasting of Nabiullah Dawood. Kana yasumu yawman wa yustiru yawman. Nabiullah Dawood, he used to fast one day and he would miss, he would miss another day. ولذلك the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص fast consecutively he would never miss it and so the Prophet صلى prohibited him from it and he said to him to عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص he said to him fast the fasting of Dawood كان يصوم يوما ويفطر يوما Dawood used to fast one day and he used to miss another day and this is the best fasting especially if a person he fasts Mondays and Thursdays and he believes that his desires is high and he's a shab he's a youth then you should try to fast the fasting of Dawood. Can I assume Yawman? Why you still Yawman? No. Yet it is disliked to fast the Dhahr, i.e., fasting for very long periods of time or fasting every day. The fasting of a Dhahr means the person fasts every single day. He doesn't break his fast. The person, he fasts every single day. But in the Prophet he said in the hadith, Al Imam al Bukhari and Muslim both narrated. That the Prophet said, لا صا... لا صيام من صام الأبد. There's no fasting for the one who fasts forever. Uh, he doesn't ever stop fasting. He's fasting every single day, never stopping. No. It is also disliked to dedicate Fridays and Saturdays to fasting. The person shouldn't singular Friday on fasting. He shouldn't restrict Friday on fasting, where you just come and you fast what? You fast on Friday. Based on the hadith of the Prophet. لا يصومن أحدكم يوم الجمعة إلا يوما قبله أو أو يوما بعده. That a person should not fast on Friday except if you fasted a day before it or a day after it. And based on the hadith of Juwayriya bint al Harith, the wife of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he saw her fasting on a Friday, and then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said to her, أصومت أمس. Did you fast yesterday? Which was a Thursday. قالت لا. She said no, Messenger of Allah, I didn't fast yesterday. And then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said, Are you gonna fast tomorrow? And then she said no, I'm not gonna fast tomorrow. Then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said to her, أفطري. I break your fast. But there's an exception here that the scholars mention, Rahimahumullah, which is that if the person had a fasting which was mu'tad, they used to normally fast. They just used to fast every single, like they had the fasting of Dawood, and it hit a Friday. There's no problem, inshallah ta'ala. If that happens, and you were not, you were not specifically looking for Friday, there's no harm in that situation, inshallah ta'ala. Also, if the Friday hits a what? Yawm Arafah. Again, that's not a problem, inshallah uh, ta'ala. If you fast that day, no problem. Uh, nah. Because what's, what's prohibited based on the hadith is, لا تختصو, don't specify Friday now. It is forbidden to fast on the following days. Number one, the fast of the two Eids. Number two, the days of the Shariq, i.e. three days after the... Three days after the day of sacrifice in Hajj, and number three, fast one or two days prior to Ramadan. Naam. Those are three prohibited times where a person cannot fast. A person is not allowed to fast al Eidain, based on the Hadith of Sa'id al Khudri Sahihain. And other than it, he said that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited fasting two days, Yawm al Fitri wa Yawm al Naha. The Prophet prohibited it, and he said it's haram. Nabi Allah haramahu sallallahu alayhi wa So you're not allowed to fast Eid al Adha. And Eid al-Fitri, you can't. You have to enjoy it with the Muslims. And this mas'ala is mujma'un alayhi. It's no khilaf amongst the ulama. Ayyam al-Tashriq is also prohibited. You're not allowed to fast the days of al-Tashriq. And this has been transmitted from jama'atum al-Sahaba, a group, a number of the companions. 
All of that hadith, you can find it in the Al-Muntaqa by who? Abu Al-Barakat, Majduddin Ibn Taymiyyah's grandfather. Uh, he mentions it. Naam, right? And it also, um, fasting a day or two before Ramadan, you're not allowed to. Based on the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, ramadan You're not allowed to fast a day or two before Ramadan. Except what? Except if you used to fast before and it was with your routine and it hits a day before Ramadan or two, no problem. Faliyasumu, you can fast. Now. Chapter 3. Itikaf. Seclusion for worship in a mosque. Now we're going to go into the chapter of Al Itikaf. Itikaf means in the Arabic language, Luzumu Shay. Seclusion is to stick somewhere and, and to stay somewhere and never leave someplace. Now. In the Sharia, it means al lubthu fil masjid. In the Sharia, what does it mean? It means al lubthu fil masjid. It's to stick to the masjid ala sifatil makhsusa biniya. But in a particular way, a particular description with, a, with an intention. Naam. It is legitimized for a fasting person at any time in the mosques. So here, the author, rahimahullah, he mentions. يشرع ويصح في كل وقت في المساجد. It is legitimate. You're allowed to. It's permissible for you to do itikaf any time in the masjid. So there's no dispute amongst the ulama that itikaf is legislated based on the ayah ولا تباشروهن وأنتم عاكفون في المساجد. Don't come into sexual intercourse with your wives. وأنتم عاكفون في المساجد. Whilst you're doing itikaf in the what? Whilst you're doing itikaf. In the masjid. And of course, there are many ahadith in Bukhari and Muslim and other books, or other kutub al-dawin sunnah in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he did i'tikaf alayhi salatu wasalam. Rather, he did i'tikaf nine times alayhi salatu wasalam. And there's ijma' that Ibn al-Mundir brought in his kitab al-ijma' uh, sorry, kitab al-ijma' al-imam Ibn al-Mundir brought that the i'tikaf is legitimate uh, but what's the virtue, virtue of i'tikaf? There's no virtue mentioned for it. There's no virtue that has been transmitted to us. Well, Idalik Imam Ahmad was asked, Do you know any virtues that have come regarding i'tikaf? And then Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said, La illa shay'an da'ifa. The only thing I know is weak hadith that have come regarding it. No authentic hadith. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a virtue. Of course it does. But there's no specific evidences that specifically mention the virtue of al i'tikaf. The question here is, is, can you do itikaf in other than the three masajids? Because there is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, لا اعتكاف إلا في ثلاثة مساجد. That there's no itikaf except in the what? In the three masajids. The Prophet said that, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Some scholars, they weaken the hadith, some they authenticated it. Like in the qawl, which is rajih. And it's in the sixth volume of Silsila Hadith al Sahih by Sheikh Nasir rahimahullah is that it's authentic. That it's what? That it's authentic. The Hadith is Sahih. That there is no itikaf except in three masajids. Now that I am of the opinion that the Hadith is Sahih, how do you reconcile that with the ayah? Okay? The dispute is. وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ المساجد هي is the alif and lam in al-masajid is it istighraqiyya or is it what? jinsiyya I mean istighraqiyya means if we say the alif and lam here means istighraqiyya means it means all of the masajids then that people those scholars who are holding that opinion huh? those who are holding that opinion that is the alif and lam here is istighraqiyya means all the masajids then of course they're going to say that we have evidence that you can do itikaf in any masajid. Those who believe it's, it's, it's jinsiyah, which I am of the opinion that it's jinsiyah, then it's not going to be a problem for them. Like even if we do say that the alif al-lam inside al-masajid means all of the masajids, then how could we do ta'arud between a khas and am? Meaning the hadith that says that you can't do itikaf except in other than these three masajids, it's khas, it's specific. And this one is general. Are we together, brothers? And the specific takes precedence over that. So the strongest opinion, brothers, is, is that you are not allowed to do itikaf other than those three messages. 
مكة مدينة and بيت المقدس أليس مسألة يا إخوة إس خلاف إس خلاف amongst the scholars if you see the opinion that it's strong that you should do اعتكاف in uh, you can't do اعتكاف in a masjid other than those three no problem إن شاء الله تعالى لكن اعتكاف brothers what does it what does what does it involve it involves you have to come with an intention okay and the person has to also stay in the masjid okay the person has to stay in the the masjid نعم and remain inside the masjid and it cannot be done in other than Ramadan because the Prophet only did it in Ramadan alayhi salatu wasalam and the ibadat are tawqifiyah you can't take it out of its uh, timing Naam. it is legitimately more confirmed in Ramadan especially in the last 10 days and it is recommended to make every effort for doing righteous good deeds in these days and to stand for prayer in the nights of Al-Qadr Naam. so it's done in the what? The Prophet ﷺ, he did it in the last days of Ramadan. As it says in the hadith of Aisha fi sahihayn كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل العشر الأواخر If the last ten days of Ramadan will enter, أحيى الليلة, he will revive the night. وأيقظ أهله, he will wake up his wife and his children, he would wake them all up. And he would wake up his family. وشد مئزره, and he would tighten his, middle, his waist. Meaning he would get himself ready. And subhanAllah, you, it shows you that the Sahabas and the Prophet ﷺ, the last 10, 10 days of Ramadan, they will wake up and do more. But us, the momentum starts at the beginning, and as the days go by, things become weaker and weaker. We should be much stronger. Also, the Shaykh mentions, layali al-qadr, that the person stands up the nights of Qadr. That the Prophet ﷺ, he said in the hadith, that's narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, Man qama Ramadan imanan wa غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبي. anyone who stands in the month of Ramadan, ليلة القدر. anyone who stands up, meaning comes with it as it should be, he will be forgiven for what? ما تقدم من ذنبه. ليلة القدر. what time is it? inshallah taala, I think we should make that maybe a time more details in the discussions regarding it. لكن for now, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said, تحرّ ليلة القدر. look for ليلة القدر. في العشر الأواخر in the last ten days of Ramadan try to look for it it's in within those last ten days some scholars they mention that Ramadan uh, Laylatul Qadr is on the 27th and some say no it's on the 29th and some say the strongest opinion is that Laylatul Qadr is not specific to a particular day uh, from those ten days it moves around so it could be on the 27th this last day could be the 27th and the year to come it may not be from the 27th so it makes us Muslims to what? Work hard in the last, last 10 days. Now, One who is performing it should not go out for anything unless very necessary for him. So if the person is doing itikaf in the masjid, he should not leave the masjid. Except for what? There's a need for it. That the person has a haja. Matter he wants to bring food for himself or wants something to drink. Things like that are haja. Or the person wants to go to a... Huh? They want to go to Qada, if the, we don't have that now, alhamdulillah. But back in those days, they would have to go out to do their call of nature. You're allowed to, to do that. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ لَا يَدْخُلُ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا لِحَاجَةٍ إِذَا كَانَ مُعْتَكِفًا If the Prophet was doing itikaf, he would not come to the house except if there was a, a need for it. Um, the person shouldn't joke with their family and their wives and their kids and joke and messaging and stuff like that. They shouldn't. Because some of the scholars, they said he enters... وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ That the man, husband laughs and jokes with his wife. And some people are in the masjid, and Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, he has a good explanation and a discussion regarding, uh, regarding the concept of using phones, and that it could also be from those things that take you outside or break your itikaf. Um, we'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala. We've done the sharah of the kitab. الدرر البهية في المسائل الفقهية